May you have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how high and wide and long and deep is the love of Christ, to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Amen. Amen. Word of God for our consideration today, our uh, portion of the Old Testament lesson from Isaiah chapter 61. Uh, again, after uh, talking about the, the many gifts the Messiah comes to bring, there is this uh, breaking forth into joy uh, as he thinks about what this now means for us. Isaiah chapter 61, beginning at verse 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord. I exult in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and wrapped me in a robe of righteousness. As a groom wears a turban, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth produces its growth, and as a garden enables what is sown to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. This is God's word. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I don't think I have to tell you that we live in angry times. We live at a time in which there is war in places like Ukraine and Gaza, and war all by itself is kind of an angry thing. And yet, at this point in time, all around the world, there are people who are getting upset and worked up about this that don't seem to have a, a personal investment in the outcome of those conflicts on the streets of big cities, in the uh, college campuses. We hear of protests going on, people uh, shouting, and sometimes even turning to violence because of how worked up they've gotten, how, how, how angry uh, this has made them, though in the end, again, it might not seem like they're going to be affected one way or the other. Uh, we, we live at a time at which there is a great increase in what is known as activism, at least compared to what I remember from earlier in my life uh, for the last five to ten years, perhaps. It seems that the uh, activists are m more busy than ever at uh, re rejecting or uh, protesting some kind of injustice or working towards some kind of cause. And uh, again, it seems that in order to be an activist, you have to be mad all the time. You, you can't just have a reasonable conversation with people about your cause. You have to be confrontational. Uh, you have to be getting in their face and accusing. It's as though some level of rage is a key component of the work that they do. And let's not even talk about where our nation is politically at this point in time. I mean, in my own family, I have heard people scream and cry about their differences over political issues. Columnists in major newspapers and bloggers have literally written guides as to how to get through Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner with your relatives and family who belong to the other political persuasion. It's not as though us Christians at this point in history think that everything's going swell. It's not as though everything is going our way. It may appear to us as though it's worse than it is for everybody else. And yet, nowhere in Scripture does it urge us to be angry all the time, or even sad or depressed for that matter. Rather, we are urged to a note of joy. That was what the Apostle Paul wrote in our second lesson today to the Thessalonians, right? Rejoice always! It's reflected here in the words of the prophet Isaiah. And so it is still God's will for Christians in our time. Christians keep rejoicing anyway. No matter what we see going on around us, no matter what we might be experiencing personally, Christians keep rejoicing anyway because the Lord has dressed us in his saving gifts and the Lord has blessed us 
with his saving certainty. Isaiah didn't live in prophecy, prophesy at a time at which the nation of Israel was experiencing a time of particular prosperity or piety or political success and peace. Well, by large, by large, just the opposite. Foreign armies had invaded during Isaiah's lifetime and taken three-fourths of the population of the country away. God told Isaiah that more invaders were coming. The people were tired of the old religion. Some of them, many of them, went through the emotions of the old faith, keeping the old ways, but their heart was not in it. Uh, many others were turning to other religions that were less judgmental, that were less shaming, that were more fun. They, they enabled a person to be able to keep your sins and feel spiritual all at the same time. They were evil times. But Isaiah doesn't turn us towards depression or anger. The Lord did not give the prophet and the few followers that he had a false hope by saying that there was going to be some immediate political and or spiritual turnaround among the people. Rather, what he did was turn them to their own personal savior and the saving gifts that he brought. I rejoice greatly in the Lord. I exult in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and wrapped me in a robe of righteousness. As a groom wears a turban and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Now, now earlier in the chapter, as we had read, Isaiah outlined the, the specific gifts the Messiah was coming to bring, the things he was going to do for the people. He was going to uh, proclaim good news to the people. He was going to heal the brokenhearted. He would proclaim freedom for the captives. He was going to bring comfort to God's people. And, and this very prophet was one who, among all of God's Old Testament people, seemed to perceive and understand and see what it is exactly that this Savior was going to do for his people right down to the sacrifice that he would make for his people's sins. Now he pictures the difference that this makes for you and for me. Because of all of Jesus' saving work, God clothes us in these garments, these clothes of salvation. He wraps us up in these robes of righteousness. God looks at his people and he doesn't see them standing there as though they are simply naked in their shame. Nor does he see them as though they are in the rags of beggars. Uh, r r rags that have been soiled by their sin, that have been torn and tattered and ripped by their rebellion. Rags so fouled by the wearers that the body order was wafting up to God in such a way that he wanted to cover his nose or perhaps excuse himself altogether before he retched because of the sinful stench. But no, that's not what God sees. These have all been stripped off and replaced. The spiritual clothes in which God dressed his people with the coming of the Messiah aren't merely an acceptable outfit purchased at some thrift store or a basic presentable clothes uh, that he bought at Walmart, you know, a pair of blue jeans and a clean t-shirt. No, rather we hear of heavenly divine formal wear like a wedding as a groom wears a turban and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. You know, weddings 2,700 years ago were expensive, pull out all the stops affairs just as they are for people in our day. You, you got yourself dressed up in such a way that it was probably the one time in your life that you were going to wear those clothes, that dress, particularly if you were a bride. And the uh, one timeness isn't just because it's the bridesmaids' dresses, which are never very fun. Do you know what an average wedding dress costs in our day? Last year, the average wedding dress ran 
almost $2,000. And designer wedding dresses can easily get to $10,000. And when do you ever see the bride wear that dress again? M maybe on some future anniversary, she might try it on for kicks to see how she looks, to see how it fits. But in general, it is a one and done kind of item. You get so special for that one day, and all that money, and that is it. So the Lord, he spares no extravagance, no expense when it comes to dressing his people up in the fruits of his salvation, in the righteousness and the salvation that the Messiah comes to bring. It's perfect purity. It is spotless love. All the product of Jesus' saving work and sacrifice. Accept it with the Lord. It's not just for one day. Accept that with the Lord, this is how he dresses you up every day. This righteousness, this salvation, these, these wedding garments of his joy are something that become street clothes for his New Testament people. This high fashion formal wear of heaven. Now, every day the Lord dresses up his people in his garments of grace and forgiveness and says, ah, oh, my beautiful bride. Like that moment when the bride at a wedding turns the corner to begin her march down the aisle and the groom catches sight of her in all of her wedding glory for the first time. This is you, Christian. Every moment of every day as God has wrapped you in robes of righteousness, as he has dressed you in his own saving grace. So what is it that made you so angry? What is it about your world, your life, your experience that makes you so depressed? Do you know that... It, uh, do you know what one day it was in my life that I paid absolutely no attention to the world news? It's the day of my wedding. I was far too busy with the celebrations and the ceremonies of which I was a major part. Do you know what day I could have cared less about the people who didn't like me, about the uncertainties that filled me with fear, about the the failings that exposed all my faults. It was my wedding day. I was simply too captivated with this beautiful creature with whom God was now joining me to live for the rest of my life. You are a believing child of God, a part of his church, the bride of Christ, Isaiah saw it hundreds of years before Christ even paid the price that made those wedding clothes possible. Today is your spiritual wedding day. And so is tomorrow. And so is every day afterward for the rest of eternity. Because God has dressed you in his saving gifts for himself. Doesn't that make you happy? Isn't that worth celebrating? Doesn't it fill you with joy? I mean, I know the world is bad. I know your life isn't perfect. I know you go through all kinds of difficulties and hardships. And frankly, if we're honest, we have contributed our own fair share of sin and stupidity. But God has dressed you in garments of salvation, these clothes of salvation, his gifts of grace, these robes of righteousness. And none of that other thing that we experience in life in one bit changes who God has made you and what he has done for you. Christian, keep rejoicing anyway. And then on top of all these saving gifts that he's already laid out before us in embracing us as his own bride, he, 
he, he brings us more saving gifts yet because he promises us that as we continue to rejoice anyway, he, he has blessed us with his saving certainty. For as the earth produces its growth and as a garden enables what is sown to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. Life has a way of surprising us. And by life, I don't mean, you know, the contents of what you live. I mean this life force. There's a scene in the movie Jurassic Park, and I understand it's just fiction. But there is a scene in the movie Jurassic Park in which the scientists who are trapped on the island discover that the dinosaurs have begun to reproduce, that they stumble across a nest with eggs. That wasn't supposed to happen. You see, when they brought these animals back from extinction with the DNA that had been preserved in mosquitoes, that had been preserved in amber, they, they re-engineered the DNA so that they would all be sterile. But as Dr. Grant says, life found a way. Now, I fully realize that the idea of bringing back dinosaurs from the deep past is probably all just a pipe dream. And yet, don't we see how so life itself, this power, uh, surprises us? Uh, the, the, the way that it has of imposing itself into our lives in various places. Take, for example, the Bermuda grass in my lawn. It very often refuses to grow on that horrid red dirt on which my house is built. But it will thrust itself out onto the driveway and the sidewalk that are made of concrete, and it will thrive there as though that was some rich, fertile farmland. I mean, I have to keep driving it back with an edger. If, if I don't, it appears that it's going to simply take the walks in the driveway over and bury them under the sod. I'm sure you've seen pictures of ancient cities that were reclaimed by the jungle and where once there were streets and buildings, now you have trees and plants growing up, sending their branches between and through windows and old doorways. Or, or how about when you look at the desert? You know, there's a very... Uh, little life that you can see in a desert, what place looks more lifeless to us? And yet when it rains? You, you know, if I or you were trying to live in that desert, we would have to have some artificial shade that we built. We would have to have some artificial water that we brought. Well, not artificial water, artificial source. Otherwise, we wouldn't survive. And yet a little rain falls on the sand and all of a sudden flowers burst into life. Well, you, you have a whole meadow of plants where once there was nothing but lifeless sand. That's because God has put the power of life, his own creative power, into the earth and the plants that he has placed here on earth. And this is all a picture. It is all a picture of the power, the certainty of God's own saving grace. So the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. You know, to the, the naked eye, the, the gospel looks like a dead word, just some letters sitting there on a page. For, for so much of our world, it, it, it doesn't seem as though it makes sense anymore. There are those who want nothing to do with it. Smart people have moved on to something new. Uh, popular tastes want a different kind of religion. And sometimes even the Christians are beginning to question its truth and relevance. But don't underestimate the power of God's word, particularly the word of the gospel. It's earlier in his prophecy that the prophet Isaiah says, as the rain and snow come down from heaven, to water the earth and do not return to it before it waters the earth to make it bud and flourish so that it provides seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. That is the power of God's life-giving word, in particular the power that he has placed in the gospel. And so we see new faith spring to life where there was nothing but spiritual death before. We see old faith 
revived and begin to grow. Righteousness and praise spring up before all the nations. It's not just a possibility. It is a promise. The Lord has blessed us with such saving certainty that Christians keep rejoicing anyway. Nothing in my experience has ever shown itself to be so dependable. I have owned 12 cars since I started driving in 1981. Other than the two I am driving currently, I believe that all of them are in the junkyard today. I have owned three houses, lived in four or five others, and all of them required constant maintenance and repair. Who knows how much cloth I have worn out just trying to keep this body clothed and warm. But since the day that I was baptized in February of 1965, God's grace has not failed to forgive a single sin. It has supported and nourished and fed this faith through my grade school years, the temptations of teenage life, my transition to adulthood, and now three decades of my ministry. And I've seen it done, see it at work, for the people who am I, whom I have served, for, for my family and friends, yes, but also for those who didn't know the faith, uh, those scores of people that I have evangelized and instructed, or the hundreds of members whom I have counseled and have taught and have married and have buried. God's word works. Because God has put the power of life into his gospel. It causes righteousness and praise to spring up as surely as the plants will grow. And that is reason for us to keep rejoicing no matter what the next day brings. Today, the third Sunday in Advent is Gaudete Sunday. A word that in the Latin means simply rejoice. We recognize it with the pink or rose-colored candle on the Advent wreath. But the Christian understands that joy and rejoicing aren't just for one Sunday uh, a little before Christmas. It never ends. Keep rejoicing anyway. And always. Amen. Amen. Please stand.